Greetings and welcome to the second of our Spectrum Out user seminars at this year's ASMS. My name is Roland Pudra and I'm your host today. Just a sentence about myself. I'm a principal scientist in research and development at Biognosis and work on the development and establishment of data independent acquisition, short DIA solutions. I'm very excited about our lineup today, Bertie Chilling and Yan Cheng Liu. I'm fortunate to have had the opportunity to work with both on interesting projects. Before we start, there is a question toolbar in the GoToMeeting application where you can ask your questions already during the talks. First, I want to introduce our first speaker, Birgit Schilling. She received her PhD in chemistry in Germany and subsequently joined the lab of Al Berlingame and later Dr. Brad Gibson at the UCSF as postdoctoral fellow. Then Birgit joined the Buck Institute of, for Research on Aging in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she now has her own lab as associate professor, where she is the director of mass spectrometry of the Mass Spectrometry Technology, Technology Center. Her research group is interested in translational research and any research that may aim towards therapeutic in interventions to improve human aging or disease. The title of today's talk is Data Independent Acquisition Strategies to Gain Deep Coverage into Human Plasma Exosomes for Biomarker Research. The stage is yours, Bearded. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen, show my screen, and then I will start the presentation. All right, but well, thank you, Roland. It's such a pleasure to be here today um, and to uh, talk to you. Um, and as you said, I have my own lab at the Buck Institute uh, Research for Aging. You can see this here. This is in the Bay Area. And as we are an aging research institute, we have a lot of projects going on. Some are more about biology of aging, looking at, um, you know, for example, protein aggregates, metabolic disorders. Some are about neurodegenerative disorders. A lot are about PTM work um, also. But uh, what I would like to talk to you today about is, you know, looking at biomarkers and particularly also at biomarkers in the context of cellular senescence. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, but, you know, a few years ago, actually quite a while now, in about yeah, 2012, we really shifted most of our workflows over to doing data independent acquisitions. Okay, so I mentioned the cellular senescence. Um, you know, what does that have to do with aging? So, I mean, aging is really interesting. There's a lot of uh, different things that happen with aging. A lot of people have neurodegeneration, macular degeneration, there's heart disease, there's vascular disease. All these uh, diseases here have age as a risk factor. So maybe there's actually a cellular uh, mechanism that is underlying all of this. And so our uh, hypothesis is that that is cellular senescence, that that is maybe, um, you know, very a basic aging process. Cellular senescence, well, what is that? Um, so one kind of thing that happens when uh, cells become senescent, they have an irreversible growth arrest. And in fact, uh, they also have a secretory phenotype and they're resistant to apoptosis. So we're really interested in the secretory phenotype. So what happens is when these cells become senescent, all of a sudden they secrete a lot of factors and that's how they communicate with other cells and, and also that's uh, where we think that detrimental function may come from. However, so I mentioned all these detrimental things uh, to you, uh, for example, with age, the senescence burden increases but there are actually also good things to senescent cells, there's tissue remodeling and repair and tumor suppression. So why are we interested in senescent cells? Well, I mentioned they increase with, uh, you know, uh, with age. And so maybe those are things that one could use as biomarkers for aging. So as I mentioned earlier also, um, we do some DDA of course, but we have shifted a lot of our workflows over to DIA. And for this audience, I don't really need to say much about that, but we're looking at really very comprehensive unbiased acquisitions, uh, looking at these windows, uh, SWOT windows, but I like to use data independent acquisition. 
And one feature is really you're not picking things for DDA, you're not picking peptides for uh, you know, MSMS, you're actually taking an entire swath or range uh, to do uh, you know, the MSMS. And uh, one thing that is actually quite of interest uh, in this context for this seminar is that Bygnosis has just released Spectronaut 14, which has actually greatly improved um, aspects for direct DIA. So what that means is you can take your DIA acquisitions and directly search them for identification of proteins, and then you can take the same DIA acquisitions and do the quantification. I mean, we've done this actually a few years ago uh, using other tools like DIA Umpire from Alexei Nesvitsky. Um, but at the moment, we really like the convenience of Spectronaut to use these workflows um, called Direct DIA. And I'll show you some examples about this later. Okay, but coming back to the senescence, um, you know, derived idea of biomarkers. So our idea is really to look what in cell culture, what do these cells secrete? And then the idea would be, well, those are maybe markers of aging. Um, in fact, then we're asking these substructures, senescence associated secretory phenotype, do they actually get into the plasma? That is actually the first uh, condition, right? That would need to be true. And then can we search for these senescence derived biomarkers in plasma as markers for aging? And then, of course, in the end, you can then look at uh, young versus old. Or, I mean, one idea is, of course, um, why we want to have senescence-derived biomarkers of aging. There are so-called senolytics that can kill senescent cells. So, but you would need to have a biomarker if you have a therapeutic intervention in order to see if, say, the senolytic will work or not. So, for therapeutic intervention of any kind, it is important to have biomarkers of aging. And they may actually overlap with biomarkers of diseases. So we have uh, recently published a paper here with Nathan Basisti, where we did the cell culture work and identified a lot of these SAS factors. And then we compared our core SAS, having different inducers of senescence, different cell types of senescence, and compared them with a study from Luigi Ferrucci, where they had looked at markers of aging in cohorts of people that like from 20 years to 80 years, they were looking which ones were really markers of aging. And you can see that there was a lot of overlap of these markers of aging that were actually coming out of our pipeline for, from the SAS, from the senescent cells. And some were remarkably robust, like GDF15 or staniocalcin. Those were things that before were not really known to be senescence markers. But what I would like you uh, to, to introduce you to a new study that we just recently did. In fact, uh, Roland, who you just saw before, uh, this was in a collaboration with Roland and Lucas, and he actually acquired the data for this project that I'm presenting to you here. So we're looking now at extracellular vehicles. We are looking at exosomes. What are exosomes? Those are like little vesicles that get released from cells. And they carry a cargo, so they can carry DNA, microRNA, um, they, and protein, of course, right? Metabolites also. And then these metabolites in, on, and proteins in the extracellular vesicles, they can travel and they can communicate that way with other cells. And they are also in the plasma. So the question was, can we use these as plasma biomarkers, for example? Okay. So this is um, a study that I'd like to uh, show you briefly. So we're basically interested in isolating exosomes from plasma and then looking at young population versus old population and trying to find biomarkers. So we've done a lot of exosome work in, in cell culture, and that is actually quite uh, nice and actually a lot easier versus isolating exosomes from plasma. Because one problem, uh, in plasma is that when you isolate the exosomes, often one has a lot of uh, soluble plasma still connected to these exosomes. So one postdoc in my lab, uh, Sandeep Patel, he uh, used some cell size exclusion chromatography and refined this so that you can, when you collect fractions later, that you get the extra vesicular uh, vehicles, that you get those in some fractions that are separated from the soluble protein in the plasma. 
And then I will show you a little bit some QC, how we decided which fractions we actually would use for analysis. And then uh, we would actually send these samples over to Europe, to Zurich, and Roland would get those. And uh, he ran those on the Explorers 480 um, that he has an, at, at Biognosis. And then we would together, and also in my lab, do a lot of the data analysis. So let me show you how we did this specifically. But first, I wanted to show you briefly the quality control. So when you just do ultracentrifugation from plasma exosomes, you can see here, these are markers for exosomes. These are surface markers for exosomes. So in the ultracentrifugation, you clearly have an enrichment for exosomes. That's a very traditional method uh, to do this. But you can also see that there's a lot of albumin and IgG, so a lot of contamination. Um, so that suppresses a little bit the dynamic range during the identification. In these EV fractions that Sandeep is collecting, you can see that the markers are highly enriched, but the contaminations are in other fractions. So this is actually a really nice uh, cleanup procedure. So we would collect these fractions and then, as I said, send them to Roland. And this is now our acquisition DIA workflow. So uh, I wanted to tell you we, we, did, uh, we wanted to use DIA for this characterization. So we would digest the proteins. And then we go two directions here. Um, one is we would have these five individual people, um, you know, five young, five old, or how many uh, cohorts. Uh, how many your cohort is. In this case, this was a pilot study. We would do DIA. Each individual file from each person, we would um, you know, go through this DIA direct uh, workflow and build a library basically on the fly. And then use this particular library that we're building just from the DIA acquisition of these cohort individuals and, and basically build a direct DIA library. And um, so basically, in the end, we would use these DIA acquisitions to identify proteins and also to uh, quantify them. I call this analysis two. I started with this. Um, the other analysis actually is, um, you know, when you take basically the same um, samples. Um, Roland then made a pool of these samples and fractionated them with a high pH reverse phase uh, fractionation. And he did receive 24 fractions and then did DDA on each of those fractions. So you can imagine that that is a very deep library. And, um, and then basically using uh, SpectroNaut and SpectroMine in order to build these exosome um, DDA libraries now. So the difference between these two workflows is that you can, uh, here you, you build the DIA library on your cohort samples acquired in DIA mode. Uh, and here you're basically using the deep DDA library and then you can search the DIA data later against the spectral library from the DDA, DDA library. And I wanted to just mention, uh, of course, you can also build a combined library. And actually, Jan Muntel and several people from the team from Biognosis, they recently published a paper where they are also discussing a lot this use, usage of combined libraries or hybrid libraries that are part DIA derived, part DDA derived. So, I mean, there's actually a lot of possibilities. You could also use libraries from, from other sources, right, that other researchers have made. I just wanted to say briefly, we also extracted microRNA uh, and did some extra multiomics analysis. However, I'm not speaking about that today. So I wanted to focus on this. So again, these are exosomes from plasma. This is not a cell lysate, so you don't get 10,000 proteins. But we were actually really happy to see with this, for example, really deep library that uh, Roland generated um, with DDA, 25 uh, DDA acquisitions, we would get around 26,000 uh, proteins and over 2,000 uh, protein groups. So this is grouped. There's no redundancy in this anymore. So that's actually a really good number. And then in our hands, when we did the direct DIA, we also would still get almost 1,000 proteins. And honestly, that is actually quite a really good number in our hands for, for plasma exosomes. So, yeah, so we have now options, right? We have the direct DIA library. We have um, the DDA library. We also built 
a hybrid library here. And then we're just trying to do, um, you know, a lot of different um, data analysis workflows. So this was the library generation. And now the next step, of course, is we take the cohort, all our young DIA acquisitions, all the old DIA acquisitions, these plasma exosomes. And we were really happy to see, for example, with the DDA library, we were able to quantify um, 1,300 proteins and um and those yeah i mean that's um that's that's a good number in, as we thought uh, for us that was a very good um you know that that we uh, could achieve here so i wanted to show you a little bit about um these different library usage and also the quantitative data that we then got and the the candidates that we would see even in the small library that already had a significant um, that uh, with identifying changes here. Of course, we will move this to like a larger cohorts next now, but even the smaller pilot already gave us interesting results. So let's uh, go uh, into this example. This is now we're doing the quantification of our cohort samples, and we're using the direct DIA library generated here in this case from 10 DIA acquisitions. And um, here we would actually be able to quantify 723 proteins and from, with this direct DIA library, and they all would have two confident peptides. And out of those, we found actually 168 showing a significantly altered protein abundance, relative protein change. So that was interesting. But one thing I also wanted to show you if you have used Spectronaut before, maybe you're familiar with these type of graphics. So what we're looking at here is the number of protein groups on the y-axis, and then the individual samples, the individual acquisitions here, the young people and the old people. Where a particular protein was identified by itself in each individual acquisition. And when, if you're used to looking at this, this is actually a really high percentage here. Um, I mean, if you look at it, it's, I mean, around 600 proteins, it's about maybe 75 to 80% of all proteins that were quantified were independently quantified in each um, kind of acquisition. It didn't need to be, um, you know, um, kind, of, uh, kind of projected from other acquisitions. And then you have actually quite a few other proteins that were share, shared in greater than 50% of the runs. And what Biognosis calls sparse, there's very few things that only show up in, in some of the samples. So this is actually really interesting. And this is, uh, I think when you have the direct DIA, the way how you do, um, you know, make the searches and the protein identifications already requires that you have say, a TIC where there are co-eluting fragment ions and you need to have co-eluting precursor ions. So those are all characteristics that also are very important for quantification. So I think the way how they do the identification also now in, with the new SpectroNode 14 with some really deep learning algorithms uh, just make it very robust also for the quantification. If we look at a similar uh, kind of uh, display for the DDA library, uh, let us compare that. And I wanted to point out again, here we saw 168 significantly changing proteins. When we then use the large DDA library, the deep li library, um, this was generated to remind you out of 25 individual DDA fractions. We had a larger number of total plasma proteins that we were able to quantify. But actually for the ones that are significantly changing, it's, it's not that much more, it's 204, so that it's more versus 168, but um, you know, it's not double. But let's look at the display. And one interesting thing is that we have actually a very similar number of these complete identifications around 600 again. And I mean, because we have more proteins overall, we see more actually more of these proteins that have shared, uh, that are shared in greater 50%. And actually, you also get a little bit more of these sparse uh, things that are maybe only showing in one or two um, acquisitions, or in this case, cohort uh, people. 
But anyway, this was just kind of interesting to see. Um, of course, we were now interested in finding out, well, what are these proteins that change? And uh, But before I get to that, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, when you compare these uh, differently changing proteins, um, they don't totally overlap. So it's actually maybe worse in all cases to always do a direct DIA library. I kind of decided uh, from myself now um, because it's free data that you have, right? So yeah, so that was just interesting. So we have a good a number of candidates here. And uh, oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say, uh, once the Spectrum Note 14 was released at ASMS here, uh, we redid all our sages as uh, searches uh, you know, Sandeep did. And we were really surprised with the di direct DIA, we got 30% more protein identifications and quantifications versus the previous version, which I thought was rather significant. And uh, Roland thought this was due really to the uh, very new deep learning algorithms that are integrated in Spectronaut 14. Okay, well, what changes? That's, of course, the most interesting question now. I mean, we just got this data, we're now mining it and looking at some of these pathways, um, but we see interesting things like von Willebrand factor, apolipoprotein E, and just other proteins. This is something where now the biology becomes interesting. Um, you know, if we do some kind of similar to PCA analysis, um, we do see the clustering, the uh, you know the, the automatic clustering that was quite encouraging between young and old here. And uh, what's also interesting in these exosomal proteins that we saw, most of those were actually annotated in exocarta also also as exosome proteins. So we do really think that we have very clean exosomal preps. And uh, what was also interesting, they overlap with our tissue culture, um, you know. SAS exosomes, senescence derived exosome proteins. So we were interested in that, and that's something we will follow up on. And you now the next step is, of course, looking at biological pathways, coagulation, anti inflammatory response, lipoprotein particles, defense response. So this is really where we can look with our biological questions into this data set. Um, but, you know, one thing we're also doing, and all this exosome data will go into this, instead of having geographical atlases, atlas, uh, we're making an aging atlas, uh, so we're implementing, we're integrating all this data into this uh, saspatlas.com, which is interactive. But yeah, these DIA workflows, uh, we really like the direct DIA feature. Uh, we are using those to look at soluble SASP and exosomes. Uh, we're interested in dynamic changes of uh, these SASP and exosomes. Well, also, we, in the future, we might like to look at PTMs and site localization and uh, diagnosis and uh, Spectronaut have some features for that also. And looking at primary or secondary um, senescence. Um, but last but not least, I really like and love to thank my group here. You can see them. This is Sandeep, and this is Nate and everybody else. And most of all, I really like to thank Roland and Lucas and uh, all my other collaborators, Judy Campisi. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Birgit, for the great talk about relevant and interesting biology and um, innovative analytical approaches. And with this, as Birgit said, we come to the questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, why do you prefer DIA approaches over other targeted quantification methods? Yeah, I mean, we also use PRM in my lab and also SRM, but I think for these more exploratory workflows uh, where we don't really know what to expect, I like the DIA feature because it, it is unbiased and comprehensive. And in fact, I also like the thought that I can go back later and remind the data again. And I really think, um, you know, when you have um, I mean, human cohorts, you don't always know what you might find. And I think it is just less restrictive uh, using the CIA workflow. Okay, thank you. What do you think is the reason that there are proteins in the direct DIA library that are missing from the 24 um, fractionated library? 
Yeah, I mean, actually, I don't know exactly. That's a good question. Um, we also really only got this data just recently. We haven't quite looked into that. But yeah, I think it, um, that is uh, one of these things that I think it still takes time to understand some of that. Um, so yeah, I can't, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm not exactly sure. But I think in my mind, what it really shows is that sometimes you take um, different approaches you may find more. Um, I mean, it's just as if you search data with different search engines, you also find slightly different things. Um, so yeah, for us it was, in, and it was actually a little surprising. We didn't expect it, but um, yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> okay, thank you. Another question. What do you think is an advantage or a special feature of direct here for biomarker research? Yeah, right. Okay, well, I really think um, because you can, Search each individual person, right? So say if you do your say if you have a really big cohort of 100 people or 500 people, I mean or I mean you know even 200 anything, you know it may be that one person is really unique. And so if you take that plasma sample that you have acquired in DIA acquisition and you then use direct DIA on that one particular person, you may find certain things that are not in most of the other people. So if you were to build a DDA library from a pool, even with deep uh, fractionation, that uh, the contribution from that particular person may have been very diluted. So I do really think, um, you know, it does give you an individualization of the data set and will allow for finding really unique and different and unusual things. So I've actually thought a lot about this recently and I really like that aspect. Okay, <clears throat> there's another question. Since the search space of direct DR is more comprehensive than DDA-based library, what is the main reason for that the DDA-based library can identify more proteins than the direct DR? It's a quite technical question. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, that's also difficult to answer for me, <laughs> but I think when you really do such a in-depth library building with so many fractions with some of these newer instruments you just obtain a certain depth in the DBA mode um, that you know I think I think it's it's uh, I'm not that surprised that the DBA library here is indeed still larger um, I do really also think these combinations of hybrid libraries making maybe DDA and then direct DIA. I think those are those are um, kind of interesting aspects. And I think the nowadays the FDR control of combining libraries is also more advanced. So I mean, I think I think it it offers a lot of different workflows. And um, I think we're just starting to really look more into these aspects. And um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. We have, we have a last question for you before we move to the next speaker. PTM and DIA, what is your experience, your rec recommendation for this approach? Oh yeah, yeah, I mean, I really like, I really like um, PTM work and I really think about it like um, the DIA offers really opportunities, but it's also a challenge for PTM. I think the opportunities that I really like are that you can, um, you know, when once you sample one uh, PTM peptide uh, in DDA mode, it would now do a dynamic exclusion of that precursor ion. However, in DIA, um, it doesn't do that, right? It's still unbiased and comprehensive acquisition. So I think it's particularly good in finding, um, you know, different uh, site localization isoforms. And I think, um, you know, DIA is the, you know, you can differentiate the isomers maybe by just a specific fragment ion. So, and that's interesting. So SpectroNode also recently has um, brought in some features for looking at PTM workflow. So then it's a peptide centric workflow. So that's actually really nice. And um, they have ways to look at um, where you can look at confirming fragment ions for a certain site localization score and diffuting ions. So I think, 
I think, uh, yeah, BIA and PTM, I believe, will have a big future. Um, and in my lab, certainly, we do everything by DIA for PTM work. And I would really like to apply some PTM research to some of this biomarker and SASP and senescence workflow. Okay, great. Thank you here already once for your exciting talk. Then we move to our second speaker. We are excited to have Yang Sheng Liu here. He worked in the proteomics laboratory of Dr. Rudy Appersold at the Institute of Molecular Systems Biology at the ETH in Zurich, in Switzerland. That's also where diagnosis comes from. That's also where we met him actually the first time. And then Yang Sheng joined the Yale Cancer Biology Institute as an assistant professor of pharmacology. It's also, that is also where he is now. His research group at Yale aims to contribute to the development of data independent acquisition, mass spectrometry, and other proteomic techniques and their applications to cancer biology and systems biology studies. The talk of today, the title of today's talk is Quantifying the, the Expression and Turnover Control of Proteoforms. The stage is yours, Yang Zheng. Um, thanks, Roland, for the. Um, I need to show my screen, I think. Can you see the light? Okay. Yes, you can. Okay. Um, thanks, Roland, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to speak in this uh, Spectrum on to user meeting today, although we cannot meet in face. And currently, I'm sitting in my apartment in New Haven, and we have been out of the labs for three months now. We just started a slow ramping up from this week. I hope everyone is doing well in this difficult time. So today, my presentation topic is uh, quantifying the expression and turnover control of proteoforms. So as that title delivers, here is the outline for my presentation. First, I will quickly share with you some recent results from my lab using Spectrum 14. Second, I will discuss a new workflow we developed called PulseLag DIA to improve the measurement of the protein turnover rate. In the following two topics, I will discuss some recent studies in which we use this PulseLag DIA method to quantify the turnover of two proteoforms. The first one is from mRNA alternative splicing. The second is from phosphorylated proteins. So for the first part, since the current release of Spectrum 14, we also tried it out on some data set we generated in my lab. Here is an example. We obtained uh, six melanoma cell lines from ATCC and measured them with our DIA platform specified below. The blue, orange, and the gray bars indicate the identification numbers from direct DIA analysis using Spectrum 14, 13, and the library-based search using the Panhuman library that is not project-specific. We can see that the library-free direct DIA analysis of both 14 and 13 provided more identifications than Panhuman library already. Compared to the previous version, the uh, SP14 further improved the identification by 7.5% and 16% at the protein and the peptide levels, respectively. So altogether, with a single shot two-hour measurement, we could quantify more than 8,100 proteins and 88,000 unique modified peptides in these cell lines. Identical numbers were achieved in other cells in my lab. So in this slide, on the left, you can see the overlapping protein list also makes sense. Direct DIA analysis covered 98% of the proteins from the Panhuman library. Uh, on the right, notably, uh, at the peptide level, we can see that compared to the less optimal uh, external libraries such as Panhuman library, the direct DIA approach actually yielded significantly less missing values. More than 80,000 peptide precursors can be quantified in all of these 12 samples. Interestingly, there is more than twice uh, of compared to that from the Panhuman library. So this slide therefore suggests that for many studies in the future, we could probably skip the tedious library generation step and rely on the advanced algorithms provided by Spectrum 14 or other algorithms and uh, softwares 
for identifying and quantifying proteins. So how about phosphoproteomics? From the same sample digest, we performed the phosphopeptide enrichment and measured the samples by the same LCDIA method with two hours per sample. You can see that, again, the SP14 performed about 9% better than 13 in identifying and localizing phosphopeptide. We could stably detect 35,000 phosphopeptide in a single shot. 70% of them can be localized as a clear phosphocyte in every sample. So how about the data quality? I'm here in showing you a random protein example of this SLC20A1 protein. The intensity rank of this protein is very low in the 8,100 protein list. But you can see that uh, we obtained very nice MS2 peaks, which suggests that this protein can separate the high and the low metastatic cancer cell lines. Indeed, according to Protein Atlas, the high expression of this protein seems to be associated to the lung survival in melanoma patient. So this is uh, just a random example. So as above, you can see that we have established a very nice DIA platform to provide both proteomic and phosphoproteomic regulations. Following that, I'm here in presenting you why and how we are analyzing the proteom turnover as the second part in my talk. So this is related to one of the research pillars in my group, which is uh, cancer and nucleoid. We recently acquired an NIHR1 grant for us to pursue this direction. We know that a nucleoid means the gain or loss of the entire chromosome and their arms, which is a predominant feature in around 90% of the solid tumors. However, fundamental questions remain unanswered. For example, the relationship between the tumor genesis and a nucleoid. So if we trace the central dogma, do we expect the protein level change really follow the DNA dosage change due to the aneuploid? Our previous data and others actually found this is not the case. Some proteins are buffered. Uh, especially, we find those proteins participating protein complexes are changing less significantly, even if the DNA copy is changed in the cancer condition. Other proteins, however, can escape, escape the protein removal process, which may lead to cancer phenotype. Certain cancer pathways and uh, signaling events can be revealed in this case. So we are working with a nucleoid expert such as Angelika Amon in MIT to study some interesting models right now. One important question that we are asking is that how a specific protein is removed or degraded by the cell by the post-translational control if there is an excessive copy of it at the genome level. Can we target the protein degradation or even proteoform degradation to, per, to uh, potentially uh, treat cancer or the cancer and nucleoid? So fortunately, we already have a mass spectrometry method studying the protein removal and the turnover in the large scale. This is called the PALSLAC or PSLAC approach. Uh, as many people know that in this experiment, you can switch the cell culture media into the heavy isotopic label, and then you can use the mass spectrometry to monitor the incorporation speed of the heavy amino acid into the specific protein and rely on that to determine the protein specific turnover rate. So, previously, I have applied a less uh, developed version, pulse select source, in some trisomy 21 cells during my postdoc time. So, here in at Yale, we are using another model, a panel of different HeLa cell lines, which were originally collected from different labs. So our previous study revealed that there is a high grade aneuploid between these cells, whereas the genome sequence variation is modest. So these HeLa cell lines present a very decent aneuploid model, allowing us to focus on the gene dosage impact. So we therefore performed the pulse lac experiment in these HeLa cells based on the mathematical modeling and the increasing ratio of the heavy versus light, we can calculate a policy of the protein turnover rate, P loss. And, and you can see the increase signal abundance for the heavy channel and the decrease abundance for the light channel at the MS1 and MS2 levels. 
intuitively here you can already see that there are many MS2 RNs can be used for racial calculation at the DRA data set level. So in order to achieve a better data extraction, we worked with the diagnosis and devised a new uh, ISW workflow, the inverted spike-in workflow. So ISW workflow was originally used in some SRM experiment in the old days when the synthesis of the heavy isotopic peptide were more expensive. Therefore, this workflow was designed for the heavy proteome spiked by the light peptide standard. This means in ISW, only the light channel is scored for identification. This is actually a perfect match for pulse lag experiment because in the early time points, such as one hour or four hours, the light channel is always there and very abundant. Indeed, we observed the 30% increase of the numbers of the heavy to light ratios by ISW. And there is no need to perform the extra heavy to light alignment to match the pairs. So this ISW workflow, as well as the normal select labeling, are both fully supported by spectrum on now. So next, we compared the heavy to light uh, ratios and the quantitative data at the MS1 and the MS2 levels. Not surprisingly, we see that the MS2 level quantification is much better with a better heavy to light correlations per protein and better quantitative precision. So finally, as shown by this scatter plot here, Spectronaut can now efficiently remove the interference B RNs and some interfering Y RNs as well from the big pool of so many fragment iron pairs. The quantification is therefore more robust with more irons at the end. So to summarize, the pulse select -like DIA with ISW workflow is now fully established with high accuracy, reproducibility, robustness, and flexibility. So how many proteins can we analyze in my lab? So we normally can quantify more than 5,000 proteins with their respective turnover rate in a cell line using three or four time points. This coverage is similar to pulse like TMT experiment, but the quantification seems to be a little bit better. So next, we extend the turnover analysis to the proteoforms. The first is uh, MRA alternative splicing. So as we know, it is actually always interesting uh, to detect the proteoforms by proteomics for both bottom-up and top-down approaches. Previously, the sensitivity is a major issue. Even with DIA bottom-up proteomics, we found that the sensitivity is still an issue to detect the splicing isoforms at the protein level. So besides using DIA, herein we adopted an MRA abundance-directed approach. We reasoned that although there are many possible MRA alternative splicing isoforms, in theory, it is very unlikely that a mass spec can detect those very low abundant ones due to the limitation of the dynamic range of the instrument. Indeed, only 1% of the peptide we observed can be possibly coming from the transcript with uh, the abundance lower than FPKM of one. So this percentage is similar to the FDR. We therefore, from very beginning, exclude the possibility that we can even detect any S isoforms less than FPKM of one. So this is kind of tuning the annotation fast A5 by using the MRA abundance. The benefit is clear. About 35% uh, more peptide become proteotypic or unique to S isoforms because less isoforms were considered to be even detectable. So by this twisting strategy, we can use the sample-specific RNA-seq data to direct the MS identification and somehow mitigate a bit the sensitivity problem. So here are some examples of different individual protoforms. Most of them are highly expressed and conserved uh, splice isoforms or variants. The kilos can be specific for the splicing isoforms for the same gene either at the absolute scale or the in, in the relative scale between the CCL2 and the Kyoto cells. One example is this TPM alpha chains. Um, so these isoforms are known to have distinctive roles in the cell dynamics in previous literatures. 
and many of them are actually high abundant. So another interesting finding at the isoform level is related to RNA intro retention. We find that the spliceosome, uh, uh, the, the spliceosome expression was upregulated in the 50s passage of the HALA cells at both mRNA and the protein levels. This may switch some RNA intro retention events into protein coding. Interestingly, we confirmed that uh, the mRNA intro retention into protein coding events really impact the protein expression, as we observed in another system before in this report. So, uh, but this RNA level event only insignificantly impact the protein degradation level. So this is consistent to the previous report that the nonsense mediate MRA decay uh, was actually happening at the MRA level as reported. To summarize this part, we use PulseLab DIA to study the MRA alternative splicing with their protein level degradation. Uh, unfortunately, we have sensitivity issue to cover a lot of uh, splicing events, even using uh, DIA mass spectrometry. We do, however, have a sensitive approach to analyze another protoform, that is uh, phosphorylated proteins. We then set up an ambitious goal here. Due to the analytical power of the bottom-up phosphoproteomics, we reason that we can quantify the effect of phosphorylation on the protein turnover for a lot of phosphor sites. Notably, this kind of phosphate transfer independent regulation, meaning that the crosstalk between phosphorylation and eucopitination was reported to be important in many signaling pathways. However, previously there was no unbiased quantitative data set or approach available. So herein we performed a standard pulse-like experiment. We used 5% of the peptide digest to perform the routine pulse-like DIA, as I told you, and we used 95% of the peptide for phosphopeptide enrichment. Then we quantified the turnover rate for both peptide and phosphopeptide. We performed this experiment for HALA7 and HALA8, representing the CCL2 and the Kyoto substrains, which are known to be very different to each other. So we first checked the key loss between the peptide and the phosphopeptide with their sequence matched. Interestingly, there is only a mild correlation of 0.39. This suggests that the turnover changed globally when a peptide is phosphorylated. So our experiment indeed was useful. To facilitate the understanding, we used the uh, concept of policy of half-life or T-half to remove the peptide-specific effect for each phosphor site. We used a concept called uh, delta T-half to represent the difference between the half-life uh, between the phosphorylated and the non-phosphorylated corresponding peptide. Interestingly and immediately, we found that the delta T half can be site-specific even for the same phosphoprotein. Even more interestingly, based on the pairs of the phosphor and the non-phosphopeptide, surprisingly, we find that most phosphopeptides tend to delay the turnover meaning that uh, proteins, once phosphorylated, most, uh, mostly increased their lifetime in the cell, which is uh, somehow unexpected. So herein, I'm showing you an example about the high analytical specificity in our data. So in this uh, RPLP2 protein, we have quantified two phosphor sites together with the unphosphorylated version of this peptide region. From the heavy to light ratio, along the labeling time, we can see that this S79 phosphorylated protein actually delayed the incorporation of heavy signal, meaning that the half-life of this uh, phosphor site is uh, getting, getting, uh, getting, long, uh, getting longer. So um, we, can, we can see in contrast this uh, S 86 does not induce a big effect on the protein turnover. We can find that the DRA MS2 level data very clearly indicate those two phosphor sites have two adjacent elution peak. The first one is S79, and the second one is S86. 
from both MS2 and MS1 level, you can see that the different heavy to light ratios between the two sites, meaning that they are turnovered in different speed. But imagine these two peptide isoforms or phosphopeptide isoforms are so close to each other. So they could be co-eluting or overlapping for other phosphocyte isomers. And the MS1 alignment may not work for this kind of pulse-like experiment, which always involves multiple times and uh, conditions. So therefore, this DIA MS2 data in pulse-like will work the best for our purpose, essentially to assign the heavy to light ratio to different phosphocyte isomers. So finally, I just want to quickly show you some of the interesting findings we made in this study. Basically, we found that the phosphotyrosine tends to increase the protein turnover as compared to phosphor S and T. Uh, and also, uh, if the peptide has uh, multiple sites being phosphorylated, the lifetime is even more prolonged. So this confirms our finding as the single site effect. We found that significantly uh, the glutamic acid, the yeast around the phosphor site significantly delayed the protein turnover. This means uh, if there are more E's around STY for those phosphopeptides, they tend to have an even longer half-life. This seems to be not reported in the previous literatures. We also try to link the turnover regulation to many other features of phosphocyte. You can check this bioarchive paper for more information if you are interested. So to summarize, I firstly showed that Spectrum 14 worked well also in our hand and everybody is encouraged to update to this uh, latest version if you haven't done so. So I also presented that uh, our turnover measurement, which is featuring the ISW workflow, it generates much more quantitative feature compared to the MS1 level. Then I discussed the turnover regulation for two protoforms or peptide forms with alternative splicing. Uh, the turnover can change, but we did not detect the RNA switching event, such as uh, intron retention, has a clear impact at the protein degradation level. With phosphorylation, we had many interesting findings, including that the effect of phosphorylation on protein turnover can be global and specific, and then the certain sequence features uh, may further delay the proteoform turnover rate. So these features, therefore, may be used for regulating or predicting the phosphomodiform turnover in the future. So, okay, this brings me to the acknowledgement. We have two postdocs in the lab, Wen Xue and Yi, in the lab maintaining the uh, mass spectrometry and uh, developing the MS analysis. Uh, Barbara Savaska uh, performed the alternative splicing and the turnover association analysis. Uh, Chen Ba and Chong De Wu co-lead the experiment and analysis for the phosphopeptide turnover project. So I also want to thank my funding and grant and the collaborators here in the middle. They are very important for my lab and for myself. And thank you for your attention. I'm here for your questions if you have any. Thanks, Yang Sheng, for a very nice overview of what's possible with this innovative approach using DIA and for challenging scientific questions you applied it to. And with this, we are ready for some questions for you. So um, it seems that there are a few PTM studies published using DIA. What is the main challenge using DIA for PTM studies? Yeah, so for PTM studies, the major challenge in DIA is actually the localization, right? So uh, it, because normally in DIA, the MS1 window is very large. So that means um, uh, many uh, phosphor, uh, many modified and unmodified peptide could fall into the same window. So, so it also if you have phosphorylated isomers, as I just showed, so this could also fall into the same window. So without a powerful algorithm, it's very difficult to localize this phosphor peptide, and this become even more challenging if you have multiple samples. That means you need to align them all correctly and uh, the, these are all localized uh, peaks that need to be aligned. So this is a major challenging, and I think uh, with uh, Spectronant and the many other softwares that have been developed, in, including some early work from uh, George Rosenberg published in Nature Biotech, this IPF so, uh, algorithm, this is uh, becoming possible now. 
So that means uh, the MS1 and the MS2 information can be both used. So this is, uh, I think, will open the future applications for DIA in uh, modification proteomics because you always have this extra information which is from the co-elution of the peptide isoforms or modified peptide. Okay, thank you. That's another question to, to, to our, your acquisitions. Are these two-hour runs or two-hour gradients that you showed? Yeah, so this is actually two-hour measurement. So the gradient length is 102 or 108 minutes, I think. Okay, thanks. And um, we have another question. Which normalization method did you use in the phosphorylation um, studies? Yeah, question. this is actually a very good question for phosphoproteomics. Uh, previously, there are a lot of considerations about it. Some people just uh, directly compare the phosphoproteome, arguing that this is a phosphoproteomic level regulation. So other people are uh, starting, I think, from Gigi's lab, they noticed that the expression of the protein level is important to consider when you consider the change at the phosphopeptide uh, regulation, meaning that you need to normalize against the phosphopeptide, uh, against the non-phosphoproteome. Uh, so in, in my lab, we actually find, as I showed, that uh, we could even do this more carefully by matching the uh, phosphopeptide sequence to the non-phosphopeptide sequence, meaning that you have the uh, same naked bone. And then once you add a phosphorylation, and to monitor the change of both forms. But this is uh, only, uh, we are still testing this uh, hypothesis. So basically, um, I, I think a short answer is that you can rely on a, a direct uh, level three uh, quantification, assuming that the sum is the same. But if you really want to dig into the biology, you need to take care about the corresponding non-phosphorylated protein. Thank you. For the site-specific effect of phosphorylation, did you have to discard the phosphopeptides that didn't have the unmodified peptide? What is the percentage of overlap between peptides with phosphorylation and unphosphorylated versions of it? Yeah, this is also a very good question. So because of the strategy that I, uh, I said is a very strict one, so we do have a problem that we can only quantify like uh, uh, 2,000 phosphopeptides with their corresponding uh, sequence uh, identified. So we also used another strategy to, uh, to, to use the corresponding protein as a bunk protein reference. By doing that, we have uh, 7,000 peptides. So in total, we have uh, 25,000. You see, we do have some sacrifice in this kind of analysis here. And another question, how do you normally generate a spectral library for silac dia? Do you have to exclude all B ions? Yeah, that's also a good question. So I recommend everyone to check uh, Teja's uh, video on YouTube. He actually have a video about how to generate the labeling uh, library. So basically what we are using is that we, we combine the hybrid library from uh, Shotgun and from DIA, and then we use this function called uh, in silico generation of the missing channels in spectral uh, during the library generation. And the B ions is really a concern because uh, sometimes, uh, you know, they are just uh, there due to the pre presence of other uh, isoformers or the unmodified peptide. So remember to click this uh, interference uh, removal function in Spectronaut. This will essentially remove most uh, B ions if they fall into the same window and also some of the interference Y ions. And by doing this, we actually increased the acquisition, uh, the, the, the accuracy of, uh, of the ratios. Very interesting, thank you. So with this, we come to the end. Once again, I would like to thank both Birgit and Yang Sheng for excellent presentations and the audience for your questions. With our user seminar, with this, our user seminar series from this year's ASMS comes to an end. Finally, you can visit us at biognosis.com slash ASMS 2020 reboot to access the recording of the Spectronaut 14 launch seminar. Also, all the recordings from the user seminars, including this one, can be found there. Specific information on Spectronaut 14 
launch RF diagnosis slash spectronaut. Goodbye and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.